Good morning, Hope Church. It's great to see all your smiling faces again. I love this. Every week we come together, get to talk with y'all, get to hang out with y'all, get to see your smiling faces. It's great. Isn't it great to be together this morning? Let's all stand. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day you've given us. We thank you for this time that we have to be together, to worship you, to learn more about you, to grow in you to see what you have in store for us this morning, Lord. Lord, we love you. We thank you. Hallelujah. The praise is rising. Eyes are turning to you. We turn to you.
God is good in all the time. God is good. Oh, you know, you all know that there is a power in the blood of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, he will never fail us, never forsake us. Lord, we love you. We worship you, Jesus. You are the God who saves. Hallelujah. For Jesus, your King, there's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily His praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. Let's sing that again. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily His praises to sing? There's wonderful power. Fresh. 
Praise the Lord. God is good and all the time. Amen. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, worship your holy It's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the
sing that day in, day out, every single day in heaven. Sing until the Lord will be able to see his face. Hallelujah. I cannot wait for that day. Oh, that day is coming. Are you ready? Are you ready to meet him face to face, to be able to sing praises to him? Hallelujah. It'll be more than this. Voices of ten thousands and thousands and millions worshiping. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Say like that. So great and greatly to be praised. Hallelujah. You are, you reign forever. 
as we lift you up, you will reign forevermore, Jesus, reign forevermore, hallelujah, hallelujah, we worship you, Lord, hallelujah. To the Lord Almighty, to you, Lord. Glory and praise, power and strength. Worthy is the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Glory and praise, power and strength. Worthy is the Lamb of God, hallelujah. Glory and praise, power and strength. Worthy is the Lamb of God, hallelujah. Glory and praise, power and strength. Worthy is the of God, hallelujah, see it out church, glory and praise, power and strength, worthy is the Lamb of God, hallelujah, glory and praise, power and strength, worthy is the Lamb of God, hallelujah. is yours and the praise is yours you're the one we bow before reigning over us as we lift you sing that again. Can we just close our eyes for a moment? <clears throat> Worthy is the Lamb. He is so worthy of everything that's bestowed upon Him. We put so many things in front of Him in our lives. For our jobs, for our families, our spouses, our children. We put everything in front of him, and he becomes an afterthought at times to us. But he's the one that's worthy. Yes. He the one is holy. He is the one that deserves the praise. So we're gonna go back into this, and I'm just gonna ask you just to lift your voices and begin to praise your king today. Begin to sing out. He says, I inhabit the praises of my people. 
Jesus is in the house today, folks. He wants to touch your life if you will allow him. He wants to do something in your life that you've never experienced before if you allow him to do it. Because that's who Jesus is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sing it out, church. Glory and praise, power and strength. Worthy is the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Glory and praise, power and strength. Worthy is the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Glory and praise, power and strength. Worthy is the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Your king is in front of you today. Your king is standing here in front of you today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lift your voices, that's it, church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're worthy, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory and praise is yours, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 You are worthy, Lord. You are so worthy, Jesus. You are so worthy, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Revelation declares that the, the elders seated around the throne they come and they lay their crown at the feet of Jesus. They sing out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Who he was before is who he is now and who he will always be. He never changes. He never will alter his plan for your life. He'll never look at your situation and say, I can't help you. That's who our king is. That's who our savior is. The king of kings and the Lord of lords. He's worthy of all praise. He's worthy of all honor. He's worthy of all glory. Even in the midst of our troubles and our hardships, we can still praise him. He says in this life, you're going to have trials and you're going to have tribulations and you're going to have struggles and hardships, broken relationships, lost jobs, lost wages. You're going to get sick. He says, that's life. But he says, take heart. I have overcome the world. Hallelujah. That's who our Jesus is. Yeah. That in the midst of everything, he's overcome. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you, Lord, that in the midst of everything we go through, Lord, whether it's in the valley or the shadow of death, or we're sitting on the mountaintop, Lord, that we can praise you. That your mercy, your love, and your grace never fails. Your goodness never fails. And we fail you all the time, Lord. We walk away from you. But your word declares you never leave us nor forsake us. Because you love us, Father. 
I thank you for that today, Lord. Lord, if there's anyone here that needs to know your love today, Father, I ask that you wrap your spirit around them. And just begin to speak into their mind today, Lord, that they are worthy, Father, that they are your child. Even though the world may label them things, you've called them your child. And we are who you say we are. And we're going to praise you for that today, Father. In the midst of everything, we give you glory, we give you honor, and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. amen and amen. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 53. Over the last three weeks leading into this week being our fourth week, I've been preaching on the four cardinal doctrines of the Assemblies of God and what they are in our belief system that we have. Uh, two years after the founding of the AG, back in 1914, so in 1916, uh, the Assemblies of God established uh, these 16 doctrines as a standard to reach, preach, and teach the gospel to people. These doctrines became this statement of fundamental truths of what we believe and, and who we are as, as a movement. The Assemblies of God is the largest and the fastest growing, I'll call it a religious movement across the world. There's no, and honestly, I found this out that over... I think it was 40% of the adherents to the Assemblies of God worldwide are under the age of uh, 35, which is great uh, as, as because that's the establishment, that's the continuing growth of the church is the younger generation to be part of that. And uh, it's awesome to see the, the numbers like that. Uh, but out of these 16, there's four truths that they, that they said, these are the bedrock of who we are. This is what we believe, but these are going to be the bedrock of, and the role that they're going to play in how we reach and teach and we preach to the lost, to, the, to those who, who don't know Jesus and never heard about Jesus. But it's not just for them as it is for us as believers, but it's also for the future of our church. The four that we've looked at already, we looked at our, our blessed hope, which deals with the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we talked a lot about the rapture time of that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But really the second coming is when he's coming back. Some, some refer to always the second coming as the, the tribulation or the, the rapture part of it. It's the belief of that we're not here anymore. Whether it's a tribulation period of a, of a pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib rapture, in a, in a sense that's irrelevant of the timing as is the fact that we believe that he's going to come and take us out of this world. That that restraining force is no longer here. We looked at two weeks ago the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And who, that, who he is in our life. We have a tendency to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit as an it. And we hear people say, I got it. Well, let me rephrase that for you. You don't get the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You don't get the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gets you. Jesus. And when we have the Holy Spirit in our lives, it's a guiding force in our life. In our direction, in our focus. It's, the, it's that little small voice in your head that says, what are you doing? I'm not talking about your wife when she's asking you why you're doing that. It's, it's the little small voice of the Holy Spirit saying, why are you doing this? Or do this for this person. It's a guide, it's a direction that the Holy Spirit gives us. And last week we talked about salvation, which is, a, which is the beginning steps of our life with Jesus. Everybody here at one point in time if you're a born-again Christian, you've made a commitment to Jesus Christ. That's called salvation. The Bible declares that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. Right. Our confusion at times, and, and churches are teaching and, and preaching this, is that they're preaching and teaching that salvation is the end all of things. And it's just the beginning of it. See, salvation is the work of Jesus. That's what he does. It's taking that salvation to start making Jesus the Lord of our lives because that's who he is, the Lord and the master of our lives. But it's the beginning step, it's the beginning process of, who, of what our walk is with, with Christ. 
And today we're going to hit on the fourth one of divine healing. Our divine healing source comes from God himself. There's a, a problem in society in the church realm where I got to go to this minister or I got to go see Benny Hinn or John Kilpatrick or this person here because I got to have them lay hands on me because when they touch me, I'll be healed. I've seen people heal without being touched because it's not the person. They may be the avenue that God uses, but it's not the person who does it. It's God who does it. And throughout Scripture, we find the support for healing. We, supply, we, we find the doctrine and the ministry of divine healing and how God used it in the Old Testament and throughout the ministry of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, there's 18 personal healings and seven mass healings that are mentioned. There's eight barren women that were healed. There's three lepers that were healed. There's three people that were raised from the dead. Two of those were children. One was because they were thrown on, a body was thrown on the, the bones of Elisha in the, in the grave and healed. A dead body. They saw the, the raiders coming like, ah, we don't know what to do with the body. They kicked him into the, the, the grave and there was Elisha's bones. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a connection with God like none other, that your bones raised the dead. Because you got the Holy Spirit in you. You got God in you. It's a healing that God does in our lives. There was also seven mass healings. Abimelech's whole family, when, the, when they were bitten by the snakes, there was plagues that were stopped that killed people. There was blindness of the Syrian army. When you look throughout the Old Testament, you see the healing that God laid upon people. Because that's who he is. In Exodus 15, 26, he says, If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right. That's a huge key right there. You got to listen and then you got to do what is right. And you give ear to the commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of the diseases that you saw in the Egyptians. He says, For I am the Lord thy God. I am your healer. Because that's who he is. And how many of us know that when God proclaims that that's who he is, that doesn't change. That can't change. Amen. It's against God's character for that to change. That's why he says, I'm the Lord thy God, I change not. So if he heals yesterday, it means he's going to heal today, he's going to heal tomorrow and in the future. He does not change. He doesn't get to points like, well, eh, I'm not going to do that anymore. How many of us have started something, we do it for a while, diets, huh? Praise God. And the next thing you know, we're not doing it anymore. We do it all the time. How many of us have said, the, I'm going to get up at 4.45 in the morning <laughs> to do something. And you do it for a week. And then like two weeks later, you're like, yeah, I, I ain't doing that anymore. <laughs> it's like, how stupid was I to even think I could even do something like that? <laughs> Coffee works great when you do stuff like that. But we do things. God does, God's, that's totally opposite of God. Just as we walk in, we can trip over the seam in the carpet. He's incapable of doing that. He's incapable of making a mistake. He's incapable of making an error. So when God says this is who he is, he's either who he says he is or he's the biggest deceiver ever. It's the way with Jesus. Jesus is who he says he is or he's the biggest deceiver in this world has ever seen. Thank God that my God is a God that does not change. When I was out of church for 10 or so years, one thing I noticed when I got back into church was the fact that the same Jesus that was being taught and preached on was the same Jesus I walked out on. And I praise God he doesn't change. I praise God he didn't look at me and says, oh, well, you had your chance. Sorry. Think about that. How many of us are praising God today that he gave us a second chance? Amen. Tell you I am. God wants to heal us. And he shows us where this, in a sense, begins at when it comes to Jesus. In Isaiah 53, Isaiah declares, Who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, 
and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs, he has carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. That's right. Amen. Amen? Amen? He took the lashes for us, so we didn't have to take it. We didn't deserve this. He didn't deserve this. We deserved it. That cross he was nailed on was for me. The grave he was buried in was for me. But praise be to God that he decided to say, I'm not going to punish my kids like this anymore. I'm going to send them the ultimate sacrifice in the name of Jesus, and he's going to die on the cross for your sins and your healing so you don't have to worry about it anymore. That when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we have this gift given to us called salvation. That we're no longer who we were before, but we are a new creature in Christ. It's a new beginning. Right. Is the road easy? No, it is not. But the Bible says in the book of James that those who endure to the end, there's a crown of life waiting for you. I need to just give me a Burger King crown because that's not the crown I want. So I can show you guys. I don't want a little paper crown. I want a big crown. I want everybody to have a big crown. We have to walk side by side like this, holding our crowns up for each other because of the works we do for God. Not to brag or to boast, but it's a gift that God gives us and bestows upon us for the works that we do. And as children of God, we're given this gift of salvation. It's a gift of healing that we're given in our lives. He says in verse 4, he says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken. Jesus shows us the pain that he carried to the cross. Who here has dealt with grief before? Who here has dealt with sorrow before? Who here has dealt with hardships before? Who here has dealt with brokenness, lost, worthlessness, no hope in your situation? But when Jesus comes into your life, when he walks into the room, everything changes. It's story after story after story in the New Testament where Jesus entered the situation and in life changed. He walked through the gate and here comes this parade of, of people. There's a coffin in the middle of it and they'll find out it's the lady's child that's dead. And he walks up and put his hands on the coffin as his child arrives and instantly the child rose up and the lady's life was taken back to what it used to be. What the enemy tried to steal from her, God restored. Amen. And God wants to do that in our lives today. Many of you today, you've been dealing with other things than just physical sickness. You've been dealing with mental illnesses. You've been dealing with depression. You've been dealing with anxiety. You've been dealing with stress and other things that life tends to tear us down, that people tend to tear us down. But God wants to heal us from that today. God wants to restore us back to the, the mind he gave us to show that we have the power and the strength in God to overcome. He did not give us a spirit of fear, and fear is rampant in this world today. It's rampant in the, the, the church today by giving you a spirit of love and of peace and of sound mind. See, when we have Christ in us, there's something that God gives us that in the midst of the hardship, there's a peace that passes all understanding that comes over us. There's a joy that's inexpressible and full of glory that in the midst of the hardship, we can still praise him today. Amen? Because it's the healing that he gives us, that by his stripes we are healed. This, this image of bearing our griefs is like everything being loaded up onto his back taking everything and putting it on top of his back. Remember, he sat there with a cup in the garden and said, Father, let this cup pass from me. I can imagine in this, in this cup, if you will, if you can just imagine this, all the sin, all the junk of your life was sitting in this thing. All of your hardships, all of your brokenness was in this cup. He's like, God, I don't want to do this. Father, I don't want to do this. But I want your will to be done. I want your will to be done over my will. And because God's will said, son, you got to do it. Jesus says, okay. 
Hallelujah for that. How many of you today are carrying your pains, your struggles, and your sorrows with you today? You walked in these doors and you're hurting today. You're broken by life today. Because of something that's happened this week, last month, last year, that you just haven't been able to get through and get over. Maybe you're, being, maybe you're in school and they're criticizing you in school. They're putting you down and cutting you down. And you're broken because of what friends, so-called friends, are saying to you. So Jesus bore on the cross for us. They give us the strength to get through those situations. He took them one by one. One thing we must need to do is we must release that to him. One thing to notice when he says, he, with his stripes we are healed, our healing does not lie within ourselves. It's not in who you are. It's not in what you are or, what, or how you feel. It's not in what you do. It's not in any vow or any promise you make. It's not in yourself at all. Your healing is not you. But there's a cross that the bottom of the cross is stained with the blood of Jesus Christ. That those stripes, as they dug into his back, the Passion of the Christ is one of the most, as some people said, the goriest movies they've ever seen. But when you look at it from the eyes of a believer, it's one of the hardest things to watch. To watch him being whipped. It's one of the, the, the most, I guess, the best depiction of the crucifixion of Jesus that you could ever come across. But it's that blood laying, staining the ground that brings our healing in our lives. It brings restoration back to relationships. It puts people back in the right mind, in the right frame of mind. It restores a broken body. John the Baptist says, there's one coming after me whose sandals I'm not worthy of, of latching. He says, who's going to make straight what is crooked? Amen. And some of us have crookedness in our lives. Some is it's a physical sickness. Some may be a mental sickness. Some may be just flat out sin in our lives. It's causing a crookedness. But Jesus come to, to, to straighten that out for us. When he walked on this earth, he had a mission. He had a purpose. He didn't just nonchalantly go and window shop. Everywhere he went, he had the purpose. In the Gospels, there's, there's 41 distinct physical and mental healings in the Gospels. One-fifth of the Gospel accounts are devoted to Jesus' ministry of healing. Out of the 3,779 verses, 727 of those relate to the, to the healing of physical and mental illnesses and raising of the dead. So Jesus had a purpose of what he wanted to do. Why? Matthew 9, 35. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. It's because of who he is. It's his nature. It's his character. He loves us that much. But pastor, I... I I've been sick for years, Pastor. I've been dealing with this sickness for years. Why has he healed me? I don't know. This is what I can tell you. I don't know why James was beheaded in the morning and Peter was let, let out of jail that night. I can tell you this. There's a story in the Bible of a, of a blind man. I brought this up earlier in Sunday school today. And in this story, there's a blind man and the, and the, uh, the disciples looked at him and said, Who sinned? Because remember, the, the Jews believed that sin infected inside the womb. So they asked Jesus, who sinned? Was it, was it his kids? Did the parents do it? Who was wrong? And Jesus said, none. Neither of them did it. But it was for the glory of God would shine through. That's right. And sometimes we go through our afflictions to build our, tests, to build our, our faith. Sometimes we go through the hardships because God's trying to get us to rely on him a little bit more. It's not that he's causing it to happen. Sometimes things just happen in our lives. But God wants the glory, his glory to be shined through your situation, through your brokenness and through your hardship. So no matter what you're going through, Jesus has got you. You have to rely on the fact, he says, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. I'll be right there with you the whole time. 
God wanted the glory of the man's healing. And he saw it. He doesn't want the glory to fall on man. That's the problem we have in churches today. I, I, I laid hands on 75 people and 50 of them were healed. I've laid hands on X amount of people and X amount of people were healed. It's not because you laid hands on them. It's because the glory of God was revealed in that situation. Praise God. In Luke chapter 8, there was a woman with the issue of blood. She'd been dealing with this for 12 years, spent all of her money, all the doctors, and nobody could help her. And she was driven to desperation. She was unclean. She had to announce to the, to the people when she went in where Jesus was, she had to announce that she was unclean. I could, I could just picture her crawling on the ground between them and just slowly and quietly announcing it. But the commotion drowned her out until she got to the hem of his garment. And she thought, if I could just get to the hem and just touch it. Right. And it says the healing power went out to Jesus and restored her. What does this show us? That even in the midst of chronic illness, we don't know what to do to get better. This is an encouragement for us. It helps us keep going to trust and pursue Jesus. To know the outcome will turn out in our favor. Say, Pastor, I know somebody who was sick their whole life and they died sick. But they died with Jesus. Guess what? They had their healing. When my mom passed about five and a half years ago. One thing God showed me was him, Jesus sitting there holding her hand. And he spoke to me. He says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you'll fear no evil. He goes, I got her. And I believed till the very last breath she took that she was going to be healed. But I also knew that when she took that last breath that she was healed. The glorified body she now had, the incorruptible body she now had. And I believed that God was going to restore her. And he did. Amen. But pastor, that's not what you asked for. No, it wasn't what I asked for. But I'd love to have my mom here. Yeah. Many of us would love to have our loved ones with us. But that's not what God's plan was. And one thing God showed me was, she's got to go through this. But the one thing I'm going to do for her while she's going through this, I'm going to take her pain away. She had an ovarian cyst the size of about a, a little bit larger than a, a little bit smaller than a basketball that was leaking. 45 days from diagnosis, the time we buried her. And God said, I'm going to take her pain away from her. And one time she asked for pain meds. And that was because she said, my back hurts. But she had to go through it. And what I saw out of that, my nephew and his wife and their son and soon-to-be child coming are in church today. My mom will tell you I'll do anything that it takes to get my family in church. And sometimes death is what takes it. In John 5, there was a man at the pool of Bethesda, and for 38 years, there was no one to help him into the pool. As the pool stirred, there was nobody there to help him get into it. But then Jesus walked in one day. He said, you don't have to worry about getting in the pool because your healing's here today. What it shows us is that God doesn't have a, a time limit on healing. You may be going through something today, but don't give up. Don't, don't quit. Don't stop asking. Don't stop praying for your healing. And don't stop believing that you will be healed. Because he wants to do that in our lives today. He may not deliver it immediately, but healing hasn't passed us. Right. You didn't miss your moment. You didn't miss the opportunity. And it's like, oh, too late. You should have been there. Sorry, can't do it for you. No matter how much time has passed, no matter how hard it's been, it's never too late for God to work things out. His timing is perfect timing. The sad thing is his timing is not my timing or your timing. What else did Jesus do? He turned water into wine. What that tells me, he could take your past and give you a whole new future. Who's, who's happy they don't have their past with them anymore? Amen, hallelujah. He healed a royal official's son. He healed a demon-possessed man at Capernaum. He healed Peter's mother-in-law. 
He healed a leper. He healed a centurion servant. He healed a paralyzed man. He healed a man with a withered hand. He raised a widow's son from the dead. He healed the demon-possessed man at Gad. He raised Jairus' daughter. He healed two blind men. He healed the mute, demon-possessed man. He healed the paralytic by the power of just his word. He healed a a girl possessed by a demon. This is Jesus I'm talking about here. He healed a deaf man with a speech impediment. He healed a blind man and another the one who was born blind, he healed. He healed the demon-possessed boy. He healed the blind, the mute man who was demon-possessed. He healed a woman who couldn't stand upright for 18 years. She was bent over like this for 18 years. He healed a man with dropsy. He healed 10 lepers. He raised Lazarus from the dead. He gave Bartimaeus his sight back. He restored the severed ear of the one man who even arrested him. That's who Jesus is. That's my Jesus. That's the healing he gives us. That's the authority he gives us in our lives that we can we can look at it and we can cast out the demons because he says, I've given you all power and authority. You saw the things that I do, but you're going to do bigger. You're going to do greater things because he gives us the power. He gives us dominion. He gives us the direction of how to minister to people, how to speak life into people's life. Quit speaking death into people's marriages. Quit speaking death into people's relationships. Quit speaking death into people's family and start speaking Jesus Christ into them and let them know there's something greater out there. That even when hope seems to be lost, Jesus is our hope. Hope isn't just here today. Hope starts here today because it starts with Jesus Christ. Because that's who he is. That's what he does. And nothing will change that in your life today. Amen? Hallelujah. Getting myself all excited here. Praise God. Woo! And why did he do this? Luke 4, 18. For the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to set liberty those who are oppressed. He has a purpose. He has a focus that by his stripes he has he has healed us, that we are healed. And you people may ask, why can't you get it together? Why don't you just try harder? You're not praying enough. You're not praying hard enough. Who's heard things like that before? I've heard people tell me that all the time. Man, it's, it's disappointing because that's not what Jesus says we have to do. He says, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. And knock and the door will be open. You have not because you ask not. And many of us have heard these statements. And many of you probably have said them to yourselves. And perhaps those who were standing in Nazareth when he said this, when he was opening the scrolls and reading it, they had a hard time following this because they knew they fell short. But imagine when Jesus starts spelling this out to them. This is who I am. I come to open the eyes of the blind. Are you having a hard time seeing life in front of you today? We need to pray that the scales fall off. You having a hard time believing who Jesus is today? I'm telling you why you're having a hard time. It's not because you can't, because the enemy's put scales over your eyes and you can't see. That's right. And just as Paul had on the road to Damascus, he had the scales on his eyes. When they fell off, he had a revelation of who Jesus was. And I pray today that the scales fall off your eyes and you can see who Jesus is. He said, I've come to set the prisoner free. Some of you are bound by addictions today. You're bound by drugs. You're bound by alcohol, by tobacco, by pornography. You're bound by gossip. You're bound by sin. But he says, I've come to set you free from that today. For where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom in life. He says, I've come with good news for the poor in spirit. You poor in spirit today? Hey, Jesus is your answer. He's here today and he wants to show you who he is. He said, I've come to heal the brokenhearted. You're broken today. You're hurting today. Is your heart breaking and wrenching today because of life? Let me tell you something. Jesus is the comforter. The Holy Spirit is our comforter. It's why he sent him. He says, I'm here today. I'm going to heal the brokenhearted. I'm going to give you comfort today because that is who he is. And I can imagine this crowd being in shock at his words. They wanted this warrior to come in and and overthrow the Roman Empire. All Jesus was doing is I'm just going to make you whole. That's all I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about you knowing who I am. I'm concerned about you getting better. I'm concerned about making it to heaven. And for you who've been trying harder, been striving for more, and you want more, I'm telling you, Jesus is the answer to that. 
If you want more of Jesus, there's more of Jesus. As much as you want of Jesus, that's how much he's going to give you of Jesus. If you come in and you say, Pastor, I'm good right here. I got a great relationship with God. I'm good. I don't need any more. That's what you get of Jesus. But when you start running after the cross, when you start running after Jesus, and you say, I know there's more because he's an infinite God. We're contained by time, by space, and by matter. But Jesus is the one outside of that, so he can do anything he wants. We're like the snow globe. He shakes us up a little bit, and he can do what he wants in us. So the more of Jesus you want, the more of Jesus you get. He says, you draw close to me, I'm going to draw close to you. I'll give you what you ask for. Some of us are asking for things from God. That God's like, if I would give you that, it'd probably kill you. Because you haven't conditioned yeah. your heart. Amen. When's the last time you prayed? When's the last time you read the Word of God? That's right. I'm not talking about just a study for a message or a class or something. Just to dive into the Word to see what it says. We have to condition ourselves to be into the presence of God. And the more we condition ourselves, the more we get. That's why Joshua was able to stay in the tent of meetings when Moses left. That's why Moses was able to go up on the, on the mountain and the glory of God would just come over the mountain and the Israelites couldn't. No, we can't go. We'll die. Because they had conditioned themselves to be in the presence of God. And what we must understand is this. The power of the cross is not found in what I do, but is in what has already been done for me. Hallelujah. Jesus didn't mean for us to do this life alone. It's not by our strength or our power that transforms, but by the Spirit of the Lord that does the transformation. His mission statement proclaims that he loves us today. He loves our baggage, he loves our hurts, he loves our hardship. That no matter what it is, he still loves you. There's nothing in your life today that Jesus says, sorry, I can't do that anymore for you. There's nothing you're going through. It's greater than the love of Jesus. He understands and plans for our stupidity. He knows the dumb things we're going to do, dumb things we're going to say, dumb actions we have in life. He planned for that. He knew you were going to do that, and he still loved you. Praise God, he still loves me. If everything you knew that I had done, that I had seen, I had said, I don't deserve the love of Christ. Amen. But for God so loved the world that he gave his only son to me. Because I believed upon him. My past is forgiven. And we can grasp that kind of love. It changes us. It compels us to go after Jesus more. And what Luke 4.18 reminded me is that I don't have to run away just because I'm broken. Sometimes a hurting heart sends us down the wrong path. Searching for something or someone to give us a greater uh, feeling to ease our pain. But what Jesus' invitation in Luke 4, 18 is invites us to stop running. It invites us to rest in him. It invites us to have an expectation that the, our true selves will emerge with his healing touch. That's who Jesus is. That's who my Jesus is. Because he loves me. He loves you. That no matter what you're going through, he has a healing touch for you. I believe the Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation 21. Amen. 100%. That's right. And when God says, I want to heal you, I believe he wants to heal me. God says, I want to restore you. I, want, I believe he's going to restore us. And God says, what the enemy planned for evil, I'm going to turn into good for me. Because right. greater is he that's within me than he that's within this world. Right. And we have that power and that authority within us. They have dominion over, over the world, over to trample on the, the snakes and the scorpions of this world. And some of us need to not just trample, we need to be jumping up and down on what's going on in our lives and jumping up and down on the snakes and scorpions that are attacking us. So what do I do? How do I get my healing? In James chapter 5, verse 14 it says, anyone among you suffering, let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And check this out in verse 15. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. You catch that? The prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. 
And the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed the sins, he will be forgiven. James gives, gives us a direction on how to respond when one is sick. Call on the elders and the leaders to come and pray over them and anoint them with oil. And as the elders pray in faith, the sick person becomes well, and the Lord raises them up. Why do we make it so difficult? Pure, easy, clear-cut example of what to do. Call the elders, elders, lay hands on them, anoint them with oil, pray in faith, quit doubting. That's about the worst thing that can happen in a service. When you're praying faithfully for people to believe in their healing, somebody back there saying, I ain't going to get that. Amen. Even worse is when you come up and pray for healing and while you're being prayed for, you're like, that ain't going to happen to me. No, it won't. Why did Jesus kick everybody out except for mom and dad? Because they believed that their daughter was going to be raised. Amen. When, when Tabitha was raised from the dead, Peter kicked everybody out of the room. Why? He kicked doubt out of the room. Amen. Doubt hinders your, the movement of God in you. Right. Didn't God declare it in your life? Then God said, I will heal you. Then God said he does not change. Then God said I'm the same yesterday and today and forever. So if he does that, he says that's who he is. Why wouldn't we believe that he can heal us? It's by faith. It's the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. To believe that God can do that in our lives. Simple faith believes that God is and that he does what he promised he would do. I don't raise anybody up. I don't heal anybody. But it's Jesus Christ who does it. So what about this olive oil that they use? This oil that he calls for to be anointed with. The biblical times they use it for cooking and medicine and anointing the leaders, showing us that we have been consecrated by God. It's symbolic of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. And it's likely when you read through it that they, they associated the oil with the healing And it's basically what they're doing. They're believing that because of the oil, as they lay their hands and anoint them with oil, that they're handing that person over to the Holy Spirit, Amen. saying, he is yours now, she is yours. Let the healing in their lives begin. That's who he is. That's what healing does. That Jesus provided for our healing in the atonement, the by his stripes. I am healed today. Fred, can you come? Stand with me across the place. Let me ask a question to you guys. Pose this question to you. Will you give God room to work in your life today? Will you give him room. Will you say, God, I'm here. I want you to do something to me today. Church isn't about just coming in, singing some songs and listening to me speak and then going home. It's about coming and worshiping our King of Kings, but it's also about receiving from God as well. Who here has a need in their life? We're watch I didn't bring this up earlier. We're watching every day Things change in Kevin's life. He told me Friday, wasn't in his chart, so I don't know, but he told me Friday the doctor was going to pull the trach out today. I'm believing that's going to happen today. Yeah. When I saw on Friday he was speaking, he didn't have the little cap on his trach. He's not supposed to be speaking. COVID ravaged his body. He's still weak, but his spirit is strong. Amen. He's not on the feeding tube. He can eat semi-solid foods, they could blend up their roast beef or whatever and look nasty to me. I don't know how he ate it, but he ate it. <laughs> he said it was good, but when you've been on the uh, feeding tube for 38, 40 days, 30 days, it's hard. But God slowly, step by step, we see new beginnings in his life, new, new healings in his life. And the doctor's like, he probably shouldn't be this far. But God. But God. But God. 
It's the power of prayer. Amen. It's not just you in the church that's praying because you are, and I thank you for that. But there's people across this country that's praying for this man. And I believe one day we're going to see him walk into this church. Amen. And we're going to see the true meaning of divine healing, aren't we, Fred? Amen. Whoo! Yeah. He's cheerful. He's ornery. He had Fred take a picture of him and show it to Rochelle and, and had Fred tell Rochelle that Kevin said, see, I still look better than you. <laughs> My question, will you give God room to do something in your life today? Just remove the junk that's going on. It'll still be, most of that stuff we deal with will still be out there in life. But for this moment, can we just allow God to do something in our lives? I need Harlan and Sue and Tony to come up. And Christy and Rochelle over here. Christy, could you hand those out, please? This is what I want to do for these next few moments. If you have a need for healing, or you're dealing with something in life and you need prayer for. I've asked these to come up here and we're going to do exactly what James said. We're going to pray over you. We're going to anoint you. We're going to believe God's going to restore you. And we're going to believe that God's going to do a work in you like you've never experienced before. It's because of who he is. God still works miracles today, friends. He didn't stop as some churches teach. Those up here want to pray for you. And you may not, you may say, well, I don't have a need to be prayed for. Well, I'm going to have you do then. If you don't have a need to be prayed for, I want you to come up and stand behind the people who are being prayed for. And we're going to believe that God's going to bring healing. We're going to believe that God's going to bring restoration. We're going to believe God's going to bring answers to life today. And if you're here today, you don't know who this God is that heals. I'm telling you, you're here today because he's calling you to come to him. He's calling you and saying, come back, my child. And all you need to do is answer him. So if you're here today and you never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or you've walked away from him, he's standing there with open arms for you. You come too. And we're going to pray with you. Don't ever believe for one moment God has stopped performing miracles. Don't ever believe for one moment that God has stopped healing bodies, restoring souls, The same God who did it back then is alive today and here today. He walked in a long time before you came in, preparing the atmosphere for you today. You're not here by accident. If you just bow your heads with me and close your eyes. Father, I ask over these next few moments, you remove doubt, you remove fear, you remove questions. Lord, I ask you to rest your Holy Spirit on those, Lord, that need to come up, that need healing in their body today, Father, that you allow your, your, your spirit to rest upon them. For those who don't know you or need to come back to you, Lord, let them know you're calling them home. You're calling them back to you. And we're going to believe today, God, that our lives are transformed. Not just one, but many are transformed here today. And we're going to come in faith believing that you're going to do what you say. If you're here today and you need prayer, I want you to come now. Fred will lead us in, in song. I want you to come if you need prayer for healing, you need prayer for restoration, whatever may go on in your life that you may say, Pastor, nothing you touched on even is a going by what I'm dealing with. Come anyways, we're going to pray over that because God wants to restore you today. So come. If you, if you can't make it up here, slip your hand in the air and we'll come to you. But come today. 
If you don't have anything to need prayer for, I want you to come and stand behind them and pray over them today. Because God wants to restore you today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to believe this today. We're believing this whole thing is done today. Darkness starts to tremble at the light that you bring when you walk into the room. Every heart starts burning, and nothing matters more than just to sit here at your feet and worship you. When you walk into the room, everything changes. Darkness starts to tremble at the light that you bring. When you walk into the room, every heart starts burning. And nothing matters more than just to sit here at your feet and worship you. to vanish every hopeless situation ceases to exist when you walk into the room the dead began to rise cause there is resurrection life and all you do are yours we want you we want you come and consume god all we are we give you permission our hearts are yours we want you we want you come and 
consume God all we are we give you permission our hearts are yours we want you oh we want you to come and consume God all we are we give you permission our hearts are yours we want you give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath.
shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great. You know, sometimes you're just not sure. Sometimes you're just unsure of, of your relationship with God. You know, last night as I was talking to my dad, he asked me and he said, are you, you know, I, I don't know how to pray. I don't know if I'm ready. And I said, well, you said the sinner's prayer before. And he said, I did? And I said, yes. He's like, but I don't know if I'm living right right now. I don't know. I said, well, we can pray. Do you want to pray right now? And he said, yeah. I'll repeat after you. And so we said the sinner's prayer last night. And he said, that was so easy. I said, yeah, we make it harder. Like what pastor said, we make it harder. And he started crying. I knew what he meant. We had been talking about the book of James, um, about the teaching and everything. And afterwards, he started crying. He said, I just want my name in, in the book of James. But what he meant was, I just want to have my name in the book of life. Because I want you to know, you are the one that puts it in, but you are the one that can take it out. So if you are not 100% sure, I'm going to ask you, don't wait. Don't walk out of that door and, and leave here not knowing for sure. Because there was a peace. Because the one thing that he was worried was that he was going to go to sleep and God was going to call him home. And now he knows that he can stand before God because you don't know. I've heard stories where a gentleman at my old church came and gave his life to the Lord. And 30 minutes later, he was shot dead in Kinderville. You don't know when God's going to call you home. You don't know. But my dad now knows that he's ready. You know, Royal Rangers has a motto that you're to be ready for what? What is it, Jaden? Anything. And I call that all the time. I'm a ranger mom. My son's a ranger through and through. So I always look at him and say, are you ready? And he's like, ready for what? I said, are you ready? And then he looks at me and says, yeah, mom, I am. If you live that life, that is what you are to be. That is what you're to do. 
So I'm going to ask every one of you, please, ask in your heart, are you ready? Are you sure? If you're not, if you cannot say it beyond the shadow of a doubt, come up here and we will pray with you. It is not hard. That first step is hard, but it gets easier after that. And nobody will ever judge you. Nobody cares. We just want you to live your life the best way possible. That's right. He said that the worst day after he got saved is better than the best day before he knew Jesus. Amen. Amen. So please, I ask you, if we can sing the song again, if you are not sure, come forward. Don't wait. Because that way you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that everything between you and God are okay. Stand with me across this place. We're going to end our our service exalting the name of Jesus today. For thou, O Lord, Jesus, Jesus. church. Sing it out to your king today. I exalt thee. I exalt thee. I exalt thee. Oh,
This last time, church. Father God, we exalt your name today, Father. The name above all names. I praise you for who you are, Lord. We're believing in a transformation in the lives today, Father, of your people. We're believing in a healing, Father, that you are proclaimed over our lives today, Lord. It's because of who you are, Father, that we worship you and we exalt your holy name. Father, wherever we do today, whether we do this next week, Lord, let your glory be revealed in us and through us, Father. As Moses proclaimed, Lord, that you need to go before us, Father, for how else are they going to know we are a child of God? That you lead us and guide us each and every step of our day. And we will praise you for that. And we give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen.